Hello, everybody. It's Evan Grant from the Dallas Morning News and SportsDayDFW.com. I am in Surprise, Arizona for spring training. As you might be able to tell by the lovely desert motif on the painting here in our uh, rental home, the uh, nicest rental home we've ever had in the Surprise area. Um, and also, we're going to be here a while since spring training did actually start. Uh, and it's going to extend into the first week of April before the Rangers open the reconstructed season, April 8th at Toronto. And there's a lot to get done in three weeks. But it all started with kind of resuming where the Rangers were on December 1, right before baseball shut down. And so I think the big item of the week was just actually seeing Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager on the field together for the first time. Uh, it certainly added a little bit of buzz to, to the first workout. Um, but I will say this, you know, manager Chris Woodward, uh, general manager Chris Young, uh, president of baseball operations John Daniels, they were all around, but it's not like they hovered over their, their two new superstars. They're, as I like to call them, they're half a billion dollar babies. Um, they went about their regular business. There wasn't any ooing and eyeing um, from, from the uh, front office. Uh, and it was, but it was just interesting to watch the Seager Simeon dynamic kind of start to take shape. Uh, they have done pretty much everything together. Uh, it's almost like they walk in lockstep from field to field. Um, conversations are there. And as Marcus Simeon said at his opening press conference um, after getting here, uh, he'll be attached at the hip to, to Corey all, all spring. Uh, they've, got, they've got a lot to do. Uh, from a baseball perspective, uh, but they've also got a lot to do in terms of these are these are the two guys who are the pillars of the franchise now, and so they've got to start developing relationships with guys. They've got to start developing um, credibility in the clubhouse, which they have as players clearly. But these are guys who who still other players don't know, and they're they're all getting to meet. And so I thought there were there were two interesting things um, uh, from their from their press conferences. Marcus Simeon said that he had been in touch with a lot of the Rangers after uh, he signed on December 1st, um, basically through group text because he was on the executive subcommittee of the MLB Players Association. Uh, he said, you know, it wasn't the ideal way to introduce yourself to everybody in a group text. Hey, I'm Marcus. I um, want to tell you about the lockout. Uh, but he did start to communicate with guys and, and did kind of get a sense of uh, who they are. Uh, but he didn't have a whole lot of personal conversations um, at that point in time. I think he understands what he's diving into. Uh, Corey Seager, during his introductory press conference or reintroductory press conference, whatever you want to call it, uh, he had this to say about manager Chris Woodward and, and the expectations that are on him. Uh, basically, he said there's an expectation to win, uh, to win every day, to win every at bat. And, and that was the same exact line that manager Chris Woodward had said was going to be at the heart of his pre-spring training uh, meeting with his players, which was briefer than it usually than it has been over the first four years, uh, or the first three years, this being the fourth, um, and it was more direct. And it was just about, hey guys, it's time to stop thinking about winning. Uh, it's time to start expecting to win. And I think also for a lot of these guys, it's about it's about also the guys who have been here. And there's not many of them. The guys who have been here um, understand should understand the process now. Um, and should be able to apply that better. Second item I have for you this week uh, is the return of Martin Perez. Uh, the Rangers did not get Clayton Kershaw. Uh, I don't think that's a giant surprise. Certainly there's some disappointment, but no hostility or animosity towards Clayton. He called Chris Young, with whom he's got a relationship with, very quickly after the deadline uh, or, or baseball reopened. Uh, and made it clear that he was going to return for, to Los Angeles for, for the next year. I think it's interesting that he signed a one-year contract with the Dodgers. I think that certainly leaves open the possibility that uh, if he wins a World Series there this year, uh, he would consider coming back to Texas again next offseason. Uh, I think that uh, it also leaves open the possibility that even if he doesn't win a World Series in Los Angeles, if he looks around and the Rangers have made the progress they think they, they have, that it's a more level playing field next year when they potentially go after Clayton Kershaw. Right now, it's it, it's not a level playing field because he's got a chance to win a World Series with the Dodgers, and the Rangers offer him the ability to play at home. But for a competitor who's made it work away from home for a decade, for more than a decade now, 
playing at home is a nice amenity. It's not a necessity. And so I think he will revisit that after this year. He certainly could have signed a multi-year deal with the Dodgers. I think he could have signed a multi-year deal with the Rangers. Uh, but I think for everybody's sake, Clayton, Clayton finished last year unhealthy. Uh, he is looking at what his future is again. Um, and, and so I think it just worked for everybody for him to sign a one-year deal. The Rangers were thankful that he didn't leave them hanging into this shortened free agency season. He uh, told them how much he appreciated them and how much he valued his relationship with Chris Young. Uh, but I think he also, and, and I think Chris, Chris Woodward said it best when he said, we probably always definitely will have a place for, for Clayton Kershaw here. So uh, that's about as definitive as, as, as he could get. With with Clayton gone, the Rangers went out and, and quickly re-signed Martin Perez uh, to a one-year, $4 million deal. It's not a sexy deal by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I know that there are a lot of Ranger fans who uh, had probably thought that the Martin Perez experiment, not experiment, but the experience had kind of run its course over his time with the Rangers. Uh, he had a 4.89 ERA in his last three years with the Rangers. Uh, and he had some unfortunate injuries that were kind of bad happenstances, right? Slamming a, a, a door on his hand, uh, falling off of a bull at his ranch in Venezuela. These are, these are unfortunate things, and he, he wasn't able to, to be out there on the mound for, for 200 innings or close to it uh, in his last three years with the Rangers. And so the, uh, the club moved on at that point. What he has done since he left is when he went to Minnesota as a free agent before the 2019 season is – he worked with the Twins and changed his secondary pitch from a slider, or his third pitch, I should say, from a slider to a cutter, and then incorporated the cutter a lot more. And he has become a cutter fastball guy as opposed to a fastball uh, slider guy. He, he obviously throws the changeup a lot, but the cutter has made a big difference. The results have not been markedly different but if you look at the slash lines that, that he's allowed with the cutter fastball combo over the last three years with minnesota and boston uh and an 825 op i'm sorry a 788 ops allowed in that time on those on those pitches versus the 825 ops he allowed in his last three years with the rangers on his fastballs and slider mix there is a significant difference in results and i, I think the rangers feel like uh, what they need most right now is they need some innings of protection, really, that can be considered back end of the rotation starters until their young starters get ready. There's there's a group of good guys. Uh, Cole Wynn, uh, Glenn Otto, A.J. Alexi. All these guys could be on the cusp of the big leagues really early into the season, uh, if not if not even sooner in, in terms of opening day. And beyond them, you, you start to get into the Jack Lighters and the Owen Whites and the Ricky Venascos. And, and there is there is depth of, of starting pitching talent here. So the idea is to get some kind of bridge right now. Martin said today, uh, this being Tuesday, uh, his first day in camp, that he wants to be a leader for this group. He's now going to be 31 years old when the season opens. And it's important to him to to be a good leader and to be a good teammate. And, and so... I think he understands his role here also, and I think the Rangers realize he's not going to be a seven or eight inning pitcher. Uh, but if they can get if they can get five six innings out of him on, on regular occasions and keep themselves in ball games with a with a rejuvenated offense, they'll have a chance to win uh, fairly regularly when he goes out there. It's not the expectation of win that we talked about with Chris Woodward, but but a chance to win. I, I and and I think that. Uh, if he is, if he proves durable, I, I think it is going to turn into an expectation of winning when he takes the mound because innings are so valuable now, and I think the Rangers' offense is is significantly upgraded. Speaking of the offense, I want to uh, make one quick aside. It almost goes back to Seager Simeon, but I'm I'm disorganized. That's what I am. Uh, but Chris Woodward did say that he intended to to bat uh, Simeon, Seager, and newly acquired catcher Mitch Garber in succession in the batting order on a regular basis. Whether that's one, two, three, or two, three, four, that's still a little bit to be determined. But uh, uh, he made it very clear that those three guys, that the heart of his offense, the three most, what he feels are the three most talented offensive players that he's got, those guys will hit in succession and hit as, 
as often as they can, uh, which is which is a, re a real reason for them to be at the top of the lineup. Uh, the last thing for you today is uh, going to be kind of off the beaten path. A uh, little update on Owen White, who, uh, not Owen White, I'm sorry, Eli White. Again, I'm disorganized. I get names confused. I have kind of name dyslexia. I've called Luis uh, Angel Acuna Ronald already. I know I'll call Corey Seager Kyle. Um, I'm sure I'll call Jack Leiter Al. And I've called Eli White Owen. But Eli is uh, coming back from shoulder, shoulder surgery after he missed the last two months of last season. And look, the Rangers have said over and over that they feel he's athletic enough to be a Chris Taylor. Is that an over-exaggeration? Perhaps. Uh, but he is athletic, and, and he is versatile. And what has happened is that he's come into camp the first few days and really put on shows in batting practice with a swing that uh, was altered by the new hitting coaches, Donnie Ecker and Kim Hires, basically in a couple of conversations and some video last November before the lockdown and really before – Eli was able to swing coming off of surgery. So he couldn't share video with them after he was able to swing. He couldn't communicate with them. But what he did is he took the message that they had um, uh, sent to him, and he feels like he was really able to apply it and make a, a more direct path to the ball. Batting practice is batting practice. People ask me who has good batting practice. I try not to get too excited about it because in most cases you're hitting off either a machine or a coach throwing the ball up there at 60, 70 miles an hour, and I may be being generous there. Uh, but there's an opportunity for Eli White here. He's ahead on his throwing program, farther ahead than the Rangers thought he would be at this point in time. This club has an opening for an outfielder, and if he's if he's healthy and ready to go, uh, and this he, he does put the barrel of the bat on the ball in this little three-week spring training, there's an opportunity for him to create a significant playing time for himself. So that's that's been the most, I guess, optimistic development of two full days of workouts. Uh, it's going to be a truncated workout schedule. The, the Rangers open their exhibition season on Friday against Kansas City, and they'll play 18 games. Uh, so there's not going to be a lot of time for guys to work through things. There's not going to be a lot of uh, – uh, of extra bats to go around or extra innings to go around. But that's why, and, and I think it's also why the Rangers are looking a little bit more closely at everything at this point in time, from the first pitch of spring training in terms of workouts, right up until the last game of uh, on April 5th before they depart for Toronto. Uh, speaking of departing, that's what I'm going to do right here. I've, I've rattled my face off for a while. Um, I'm still really uncomfortable with this but I'm trying to get better, uh, and I will take all your suggestions. You can email me at egrant at dallasnews.com. If you want me to wear funny hats, um, put a pie in my face, whatever, just let me know. Uh, and if there's things that you'd like to hear discussed about or discussed in these rambling videos, please also send those along. So until next week, until I ramble again, so long from the desert.